Good afternoon, everyone, uh, and welcome to Parsons Technical Webinar Series. I'm your host today, Jessica Bennett. Uh, we have a great webinar uh, that will be presented by Justin King and Carrie Crozier uh, on an integrated and holistic approach to restoring chlorinated solvent sites in restricted environmental settings. Uh, a few housekeeping items first. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Uh, we will be muting all phone lines um, during the webinar uh, until the Q&A session at the end. Uh, if you have any questions, you can enter them into the chat feature at any time during the webinar, um, and we'll hold them until the end. And you can also ask a question live at the end as well, and we'll uh, call on you as questions come up. Uh, and please state your name and location uh, who you're with when you ask questions. Um, so a little bit about uh, the guest speakers today. Uh, Justin King is a field project manager for multiple private and municipal clients. He has more than 15 years experience in site assessment and cleanup of highly contaminated sites. Uh, and Carrie Crozier is a project manager and geologist specializing in managing assessment and remediation of sites impacted with aerial deposited metals, petroleum hydrocarbons, and chlorinated solvents. She has 15 years experience in environmental investigations. Uh, this webinar has also been approved for CEU credits. Uh, there will be a sign-in sheet uh, posted toward the end of the webinar that you can download and then fill out and return to us. Uh, if you have any issues downloading the uh, attendance form and you want CEUs, you can email me at jessica.bennett at parsons.com. And uh, this webinar is being recorded and will be posted on our YouTube channel uh, following uh, today's webinar. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Justin. Thank you, Jessica. So I'm going to start with a core value. Um, Parsons has uh, these core values, which are diversity, innovation, integrity, quality, safety, sustainability. Safety is the one I'm going to focus on today. Safety is a core value at Parsons. When it comes to safety, health and the environment, every Parsons employee is empowered to own zero incidents. Our motto, Own Zero, articulates our mindset that all SH and E incidents are preventable and that we're all responsible for preventing them and we're empowered to do so. I talk a little bit about snakes because snakes are uh, a problem on the site that we'll be discussing today. Rattlesnakes are widespread in California and are found in a variety of habitat throughout the state from coastal to desert areas. Rattlesnakes may also be found around homes and in yards with brush areas or under wood piles. Rattlesnakes are generally non-aggressive and will likely retreat if given room or not deliberately threatened. Most bites occur when a rattlesnake is handled or accidentally touched by someone walking or climbing. According to the California Poison Control System, hundreds of rattlesnake bites are reported annually in California, with most occurring between April and October. I'm going to give some general tips to prevent rattlesnake bites. Uh, the first tip would be to wear boots and long pants when hiking to help block rattlesnake venom. You should never go barefoot or wear sandals when walking in areas rattlesnakes are known to inhabit and you cannot clearly see where you are placing your feet. You want to stay on trails when hiking, stay away from underbrush and tall weeds. Uh, also, do not disturb a snake even if it appears to be dead. Always look for concealed snakes before picking up rocks, firewood or equipment, piles of rocks or logs, Patches of dense shrubs and old equipment that has been lying around are only a few places that you may find a rattlesnake. Never hike alone or walk alone in remote areas. Always have someone to assist you in case of an emergency and know where the nearest hospital is or the best way to call for help. And lastly, teach children to respect snakes and leave them alone. If you are bitten by a rattlesnake, you want to get immediate medical attention as severe or life-threatening symptoms can occur within minutes after the bite or in other cases can begin several hours after the bite. Symptoms are extreme pain and swelling at the location of the bite, excessive bleeding, nausea, swelling in the mouth and throat making it difficult to breathe, lightheadedness, drooling, and even collapse and shock in rare cases. You should never apply ice, do not use a tourniquet or constricting band, and don't try to suck out the venom. Um, you also shouldn't try to, any device to cut or slice the bite site. Uh, lastly, keep calm, do not run, and keep the affected extremity below heart level until you can be transported to a medical facility. So as I said, rattlesnakes are routinely spotted at the site we will be discussing in our technical presentation. 
We have some site specific mitigation measures, which includes conducting brush clearance around monitoring wells and in areas that work will need to be workers will need to access. You can see in the bottom left photo uh, our brush hog clearing some brush around a monitoring well. Before the brush hog comes out, we have a biologist come out and clear all snakes and other critters. We also conduct worker training prior to field mobilization. We usually have a pre meal field mobilization call to discuss site specific hazards and discuss snakes. Uh, all Parsons staff and contractors are required to wear snake chaps at all times when on site. And that's actually me wearing my snake chaps in the bottom right photo. Uh, the snake chaps go from about the top of your boot to just below your knee and will prevent any snakes from biting you in that area. Also, because the site is in a remote area and far from an area hospital, all, person, all Parsons personnel are informed to use a landline at the site in order to cal call CalSTAR. CalSTAR will use a helicopter to pick up the patient and they know which of the three area hospitals have the anti-snake venom. There's a couple other uh, safety concerns that are above and beyond our normal working conditions. Uh, the site is in a remote canyon and there's no cell phone reception. There is a landline. You can see in the photo in the background, a mod space, and that's where the landline is located. Uh, we also um, have uh, some tough evacuation routes. Coming into the site is a paved road, but if that road were to be blocked, uh, there is actually a train uh, line, railroad line right over that road. If it, there was a train derailment and we needed to get out of the canyon the other way, we would have to have a four by four. Uh, and then medical emergencies require a helicopter airlift, especially if they're severe because of the uh, distance to the local hospitals. And the last um, safety concern, during the implementation of our remedy, it actually happened during the COVID surge and all field personnel were staying in hospitals, so that presented another challenge. Go over uh, site history and the location. The site lies within Santa Barbara County in Southern California. The area is subject to a Mediterranean climate typified by warm to hot summers and mild winters. The average, average annual rainfall is approximately 19.5 inches. However, rainfall patterns are influenced by the El Nino La Nina Southern Oscillation. So annual rainfall can range from less than 10 inches to more than 30 inches. The site includes a graded pad with an abandoned warehouse in an agricultural area within a small canyon. There is an intermittent stream located in the canyon that typically only flows during large rain events. Uh, it's kind of hard to see, but the, the light blue line it shows our intermittent stream that's downgrading of our site. The site has been owned by the same third party owner since the early 1960s. Land use at and in the general vicinity of the site mainly consists of livestock grazing. The site is also used as a staging area for oil field restoration activities. Oil field restoration activities are unrelated to our client and performed by a separate consultant. The site has been used by multiple entities in the last 100 years. A former lamp black facility was located on the same graded pad as the abandoned warehouse. We are not exactly sure what the lamp black facility was used for, but they may have had their own mini MGP site to generate gas for on-site equipment and could have generated lamp black, or they may have imported it from somewhere else as a potential fuel source for on-site heating or fuel for boilers. Lamp black is a byproduct generated as part of the conversion of natural gas or coal from burning it. It has characteristics of charcoal from coal firing in some forms and can be a tarball from oil farm firing in other forms. The former lamp black warehouse can first be seen on aerial photographs dating back to the 1920s. The lamp black facility was operated on the graded pad until the 1950s. In 1961, land west of the lamp black facility on the graded pad was leased to our client. The Cl County Planning Commission issued a land use permit for a missile cleaning facility. The client has no records of any chemicals being used at the site, and there are no site maps showing where activities took place. Oil field be production began in 1964 and ceased in 1994. As discussed earlier, the oil field operations, decommissioning of production wells and piping, and restoration activities are being performed for an oil company by a separate consultant. The oil field abandonment and restoration activities were initiated in 1994 and are ongoing. The oil field's primary COCs or chemicals of concern are petroleum hydrocarbons. In the early 2000s, the oil company's consultants detected trichloroethane or TCE and related breakdown products in soil and groundwater near the abandoned warehouse 
that had been leased by our client. And you can see the abandoned warehouse on the graded pad in the center of this slide. After a record search and consultation with the Central Coast Regional Water Quality Control Board, a letter was issued to our client by the Water Board requesting the submittal of a work plan for vertical and horizontal assessment of the chlorinated solvents at the site. After multiple years of negotiating an access agreement with the site owner, Parsons commenced site assessment activities in 2014. So there are multiple site challenges. Uh, these include negotiating multiple access agreements with multiple stakeholders. Uh, we have an access agreement with the site owner, and we also have an access agreement with the oil company that has a surface lease with the site owner. The oil company actually requires that their consultant be on site at all times while Parsons is working. Because the oil company is conducting investigations and remediations in the same general area we are working in, all field work must be carefully scheduled to avoid working simultaneously as the oil company's consultants. Another uh, challenge was there were no site plans and no one to interview in order to gain insight into the location and what kind of activities had occurred at the site. There was also no history of chlorinated solvent use at the site. The only information was the sparse groundwater and soil data collected by the oil fields oil company's consultants. Other challenges at the site include the intermittent stream downgradient of the abandoned warehouse, the presence of shallow bedrock, and extensive permitting that was required for implementation of the remedy. And we'll get into the permitting a little bit later into the presentation. I'll talk about site assessment. Um, so we did not have any knowledge regarding the source of the soil and groundwater contamination. In order to begin assessment of the site, we conducted a passive soil gas survey using Beacon Environmental. Passive soil gas surveys provide a cost-effective way to accurately design a site conceptual model and streamline the remediation and monitoring program by identifying source areas and delineating migration pathways. The survey was used to determine the presence and location of any hotspots of chlorinated solvents in the vapor phase in the vicinity of the abandoned warehouse that had been leased by the client. A grid of 73 probes with a 50-foot spacing was installed at the site. The passive soil gas survey was self-performed by Parsons using a roto hammer to drill holes at each location to approximately three feet below ground surface. The probes consisting of a glass vial containing four hydrophobic absorbent cartridges were installed within a one inch diameter casing and the casing was covered with aluminum foil. Depending on where the probes were located, either native soil or concrete was used to cover the probes. The total exposure time of the probes ranged from 21 to 22 days when they were retrieved and sent to Beacon Environmental for analysis using EPA method 8260 for volatile organic compounds. There was an area west of the abandoned warehouse that we did not have access to during the 2014 event. The CVOCs that were detected in the passive soil gas survey included PCE, TC, and daughter products, 11DCA, 14-dioxane, and 111TCA. Other constituents that were detected but are not considered chemicals of concern related to our client's operations included TPH and BTEX. TCE was a CVOC with the most widespread and the highest detections in soil gas. The top figure on this slide shows the TCE results of the passive soil gas survey in 2014, with the blue colors showing very low concentrations, trending from yellow to orange, with the highest concentrations shown in red. Probes with no detections have no color. As you can see on the figure, the TCE concentrations are highest southwest of the abandoned warehouse. The abandoned warehouse is located, if you can see my marker, kind of in the center of the photo. Immediately after the passive soil gas survey, four groundwater monitoring wells were installed down gradient of the abandoned warehouse. Between 2014 and 2017, six soil borings were advanced, nine groundwater monitoring wells, and six vapor monitoring probes were installed at the site. In 2017, a second passive soil gas survey was conducted to further delineate the lateral footprint of TCE to the north and west of the graded pad. Locations near the abandoned warehouse were replicated from the first event. Probes were added on the property that had been previously inaccessible to the west of the abandoned warehouse and probes were added immediately north and south of the intermittent stream. The procedures for installation, collection, and sample analysis were identical to the 2014. The bottom uh, figure on this slide shows the TCE concentrations in soil gas from the 2017 event. 
and the 2017 event confirmed the 2014 findings in delineated soil gas. Based on the results of the 2017 soil gas survey, it was determined that TC and other CVOCs had been sufficiently delineated at the site in soil gas. The highest mass of TC in soil gas was again detected southwest of the abandoned warehouse and on the north side of the intermittent stream. CVOCs were not detected on the south side of the intermittent stream. The lithology of the site is fine grained elusive. Uh, I'm we're having a technical difficulty. I'm going to move on. The lithology of the site is fine grained recent alluvium overlying the Todos Santos member of the Sisquoc formation. The Todos Santos member is a low permeability porcelainless clay stone that may be as thick as 1500 feet in this area. The upper portion of the Todos Santos member is fractured, but fractures do not constitute a water bearing zone. The alluvium is derived from the Todos Santos member and is fine grained clays and silts. Groundwater in the site vicinity is generally limited to the alluvium overlying the bedrock and may be present in limited quantities within the fractured bedrock. Groundwater in the site vicinity is not used for human consumption because the yield is low and total dissolved solids are high. However, groundwater is used to provide water for cattle. The intermittent stream is located south of the graded pad that the, the abandoned warehouse is located on and approximately 20 to 30 feet lower than the graded pad. When flowing, the stream flows to the west. The depth of water in groundwater wells at and near the site typically ranges from between three feet below ground surface to 24 feet below ground surface. The variable range in depth of water is partially due to the site being located on and near a graded pad in an area of steep topography and the presence of shallow bedrock. The groundwater gradient follows surface topography towards the intermittent stream south of the site and then west-southwest with a gradient of 0.05 to 0.1 feet per feet. As of 2020, Quarterly monitoring of groundwater was being conducted using 13 groundwater monitoring wells installed by Parsons and four monitoring wells that had been previously installed by the oil company's consultants. Monitoring at the groundwater wells was conducted using low flow techniques with a maximum purge rate of 100 milliliters per minute due to the limited groundwater in the area. Monitoring of surface water of the intermittent stream when it was present was conducted at one upgrading location and five downgradient locations. And this is actually an upgradient location and you can see the streams not flowing it's just pooling so surface water only flows in the inter intermittent stream after multiple large storm events have passed through the region over a very short period of time since surface water sampling began in 2015 samples have only been collected twice while the intermittent stream was flowing most often if surface water is collected it's only collected at a couple locations where the stream would pool but typically the locations were dry and no surface water was collected during our quarterly events. Consistent with the passive soil gas survey, TCE is the main chemical of concern at the site in groundwater. The highest concentrations of TCE and associated degradation products in groundwater are located again down gradient of the abandoned warehouse. Concentrations of TCE decrease as the site, as the distance from the abandoned warehouse increases and dotted products such as CIS-12DC generally increase. The concentrations are not fully down, uh, defined down gradient of the site. In order to rapidly address impacts discovered at the site, a removal corrective action plan was negotiated with the Central Coast Regional Water Quality Control Board. The original corrective action plan or CAP an addendum consisted of an excavation at the TCE source areas and two smaller excavations at TCE hotspots. I know this kind of cuts off the, uh, the dialogue boxes. Uh, the main excavation is this larger square, uh, and that was uh, due to be excavated to 11 feet below ground surface. And then we have two smaller ones. The one just to the left of the main one uh, would go again to 11 feet. That's about where water is or 12 feet. And then the one near the intermittent stream would go to about six feet below ground surface. A chemical oxidant would be placed in the bottom of the excavations, coincident with the top of the water table in order to degrade TCE mass below the water through chemical oxidation. 
The impacted materials will be trucked off site and disposed of at an appropriate landfill after waste characterization. Clean fill along with clean sloping material would be used to backfill the excavations. To prevent chlorinated solvent discharge into the intermittent stream, chemical oxidant injections were initially proposed throughout the plume core between the source excavation and intermittent stream. The injection of chemical oxidant in the area would de directly destroy contaminant mass remaining in the subsurface that may eventually migrate to the intermittent stream, thus reducing long-term impacts to surface water. A direct push injection pilot study was proposed to determine the achievable injection radius of influence, injection point spacing, and oxidant injection rates. Prior to the pilot study, a bench scale test was conducted to determine if by injecting a chemical oxidant at the site, there was a possibility of enhancing the solubility of naturally occurring metals due to changes in the redox conditions and or pH within the injection area. Although metal concentrations generally attenuate outside of ISCO application areas, hexavalent chromium has an increased potential to migrate. The potential for mobilization of chromium at the site was high enough that a cautious approach was warranted. Soil and groundwater were collected from two areas at the site that corresponded to where the chemical oxidants would be applied. Groundwater was collected from two existing monitoring wells and soil was collected using a direct push drill rig. Soil samples were collected from beneath the water table at multiple vertical intervals from within the target excavation oxidant application area. The soil and groundwater samples were shipped to Parsons internal lab in Syracuse, New York. Our internal lab composited the soil at each drilling location. A total of six microcosms were constructed for the two sampling locations and an additional three microcosms were constructed as quality assurance controls using an unamended control. Treatment and control sets of microcosms included an unamended control where no treatment was added, microcosm location one, which is the first location we collected soil and groundwater from, plus the chemical oxidant matching dosing rate and product selection outlined in the corrective action plan, and microcosm location two, plus the chemical oxidant matching the dosing rate and product selection outlined in the cap. Samples were collected within two hours of constructing the microcosm, and the samples were sent to an independent laboratory to test for total chromium and hexavalent chromium. Samples were extracted after one week, three weeks, and six weeks and sent to the independent laboratory for analysis. The graph on the presentation slide shows the total chromium and hexavalent chromium detected over time in the area two microcosm. The y-axis shows the concentration of total chromium and the x-axis or an and the x and hexavalent chromium and the x axis shows the elapsed time. As shown on the graph, hexavalent chromium and total chromium both increased over time, and most of that chromium was in the form of hexavalent chromium. So the bench scale test showed that the application of per sulfate based chemical oxidant and based activator mobilized natural occurring chromium at the site into the aqueous phase, and the majority of the chromium was hexavalent chromium. Although the laboratory study provided idealized conditions, the study showed the potential for hexavalent chromium to be present in groundwater at levels which exceed the two microgram per liter action level after a chemical oxidant had been introduced into the subsurface. So in area one, we had 38.7 micrograms per liter, in area two, 22.4 micrograms per liter. The results of the laboratory study indicated that the potential for mobilizing unacceptable levels of chromium through the application of a chemical oxidant was significant, and as a result, an addendum was drafted to replace the previously proposed chemical oxidant with zero-valent iron, or ZVI, to provide long-term in situ contaminant reduction while avoiding the potential to mobilize chromium. Parsons subsequently prepared and submitted an amended amendment describing the alternate remedy of replacing chemical oxidant with zero valent iron, and the alternate remedy was approved by the Central Coast Regional Water Quality Control Board. So chemical oxidant was replaced at the bottom of the excavations with a one foot thick 50-50 mix of sand and zero valent iron, and the chemical oxidant injections were replaced with construction of a permeable reactive barrier using macro scale ZVI. And I'm going to turn it over to Carrie to get into uh, the specifics of the remedy and the implementation. It's going to take a second because we're having some technical difficulties and I got to switch earpieces. Thanks, Justin. 
OK, so I'm going to give some background on the final remedial remedy and how we implemented it within the field. So as Justin mentioned, we retained the option to excavate soil from the three areas, the largest of which you can see a little more clearly on this side is pretty close to that warehouse. And then the one to the left of that is a little smaller and the one to the very far to the south is right up against that intermittent stream call that excavation area B and you can see there's a purple line through that. That is where we put our PRB or permeable reactive barrier. I'm going to give you a little background on a couple of the terms we'll be using for the rest of the presentation. First of all, permeable reactive barrier. What is this? So this is a wall that we build underground and it is permeable as the name implies and water can flow through that and as it does whatever we construct the wall out of will sorb or destroy the contamination just I mentioned we used zero valent iron for this I'll get into that on the next slide but a little bit more about what PRBs or permeable reactive barriers are they're really designed to protect down gradient receptors they're not a source zone treatment uh, they're for groundwater that's already impacted and on the move they do require significant compliance and performance monitoring to ensure that they're meeting remedial targets. And in addition, they stay in place at case closure. So they're a great long term remedy. Another definition here is zero valent iron. So this is a, in our case, a granulated iron and the outer valence of those iron atoms is completely full of electrons. Once we put those in situ, they react with the material around them and they oxidize to ferrous or ferric iron. And as this pl takes place, a lot of hydrogen is produced. So the hydrogen is really good at breaking down chlorinated solvents. There are two uh, de dechlorination sequences that we typically see. Uh, biotic takes TCE and breaks it down to cis-DCE, vinyl chloride, and onto ethene. And the abiotic pathway breaks TCE down to chloral acetylene, acetylene, and then finally to ethene as well. So both of these tend to happen within a ZDI PRP. A little bit on how we designed this particular PRP. We had to take a lot of site specific data into account. So we looked at the hydraulic conductivity and gradient, the porosity and groundwater velocity. And once we knew about how long groundwater would be spending within our wall, uh, we could determine a thickness. So we looked at a four foot thickness, which is the standard width of the excavator bucket that we wanted to use. So it makes it very easy to implement in the field. So we had a residence time of 8.6 days. We also wanted to know what, that we would be completely degrading our TCE. And so the TCE concentration on average coming into the wall is 1,000 micrograms per liter. Our cleanup level is 5 micrograms per liter, and it's got a degradation time of about 10 hours for half-life. And what's really critical more than the time spent in the wall is that every TCE atom uh, molecule comes in contact with ZVI. So we want to make sure that we have enough ZVI in the wall and it's thick enough that all the TCE is going to come in contact with the ZVI itself. A little bit more on the specific formulation of ZVI we used at this property. We used a macro scale granular ZVI. That's what you're seeing on the upper right hand side. And on the left hand side, we have a clean quarry sand from a local quarry. So these were mixed in different formulations for different parts of the project. Uh, in total, we purchased over 900,000 pounds of ZVI. We shipped in from Happier Technologies in Michigan all the way to the central coast of California. And we mixed two different ratios for the PRB. We had a 25% ZVI to 75% sand by weight. And for the excavation bottoms, it was a 50-50 ZVI to sand mix. Now I'll give a little bit of details on how we implemented these plans in the field. As Justin mentioned at the top, this was a site with extensive permitting. There are fairly typical permits that we see for a lot of remedial actions, including a land use permit from the county, uh, the grading permit, the air pollution control district permit to operate, and the encroachment permit. But for this site, because we have uh, friendly locals like the two shown on this side, uh, including a California salamander and a red-legged frog who are both threatened species, we had a California Department of Fish and Wildlife permit. And we also, because we were right up against that stream, 
had a Clean Water Act Section 401 water quality certification from the Regional Water Quality Control Board and U.S. Army Corps of Engineers nationwide permit. So a lot of these permits had to be obtained in sequence. And with COVID to slow things down, uh, it did take us about 18 months from start to finish for the total permitting process. As you can imagine, there were some sensitive site conditions. Um, you can see on the lower left hand side, one of our snakes that made it into the excavator bucket overnight and got too cold to move out on its own power. So we had a biologist on site both to keep an eye out for threatened species and to move snakes for us. So she did remove this one as well as many others throughout the project. Um, uh, we also were within an agricultural area, as Justin mentioned. You can see in the lower right hand side, uh, the PRB and excavation area B were within a cow pasture. And the cows were very, very curious about our silt fence. So we had to install some additional fencing to keep them out and away from the work zone. Um, additionally, uh, the site is within an area known to be historical uh, Chumash uh, tribe settlements. So we had an archaeologist and a representative from the local Chumash tribe on site throughout the project, as well as a full time air monitoring person from Parsons. And I'll discuss that next. So the air quality permit for this project was particularly restrictive. Um, again, we're in a cow pasture and we want to make sure we're not spreading any impacted soil outside of our work area. So we had uh, rules for no fugitive or visible dust. If you look on the photo on the upper right hand side, there's a water truck. They sprayed water over any time we were excavating and also uh, across the site to make sure we weren't kicking up dust as we were tracking around with trucks and other things. So a lot of water use on this project. Uh, we had a, a no odors rule. Fortunately, we didn't really come across any odors from this project. We also had to check each stockpile every 30 minutes for dust and odors. And uh, we also had a ring of 30 air monitoring stations that had to be about 500 feet outside of the work area. And that ring to, to walk the entire thing is about a half a mile loop. So hats off to Eddie Dabsis, our air monitoring staff, who put in a lot of miles on this project. Um, additionally, at the end of the day, all the stockpiles and excavations did need to be covered with plastic. A little bit about the on-site logistics. Uh, it's a little hard to tell from this uh, angle, but we were in a fairly steep canyon. The top of this image is about 40 feet above the area with the warehouse, and the warehouse itself is 20 to 30 feet above the road, which is again about 10 to 15 feet above the PRB. So we're on a fairly steep hill, which made line of sight between where we were staging things and where we were doing the work down by the stream pretty difficult. There was a lot of communication by radio and a lot of coordination and scheduling. Uh, in addition, the area with the PRB and excavation area B was too steep to bring in trucks. So any materials that needed to be brought there or any export soil that needed to come out of that area had to be loaded onto smaller trucks, brought up to the graded pad, and then staged there. Uh, the road that comes around to the south is a bit of a blind corner because of the steep hill there. So to ensure that we didn't have any sort of issues with the trucks colliding, we had a one way traffic flow through the site. The trucks came in from the west, either dropped their load or were loaded up for export and then exited to the east and out. So I'll talk a little bit now about how we mix the CBI. As I mentioned, we purchased 923,000 pounds of CBI. This came in in more than 300 super sacks, and you can see some of them there staged on the site. Each super sack came in on a pallet, and there were about 14 pallets to a truck. We needed a long reach, heavy duty forklift to unload the trucks, and it took a crew of three people about a week to unload all 308 super sacks from those trucks. Uh, so it was really critical to, to make sure we had spread them out so they didn't all arrive in one day. And as you can imagine, when you're leaving Michigan to drive all the way to California in winter, trucks can get uh, bunched up a bit, but we made it work. Um, as far as the ZBI mixing goes, we calculated the bucket of the loader, so we knew how much sand was in each scoop, and we knew how much CBI to add to each bucket load of sand. 
So in the upper right hand side, you can see we put down a pad of clean sand, place the appropriate amount of ZVI on top, and then the loader would mix the pile It would basically flip it over a couple of times, spread it out, build it back up and flip it over. It took about an hour to mix a 30 cubic yard pile of, of sand and ZVI. Once that was done, we would take a quality assurance test. So you can see our field engineer, Jeff Gravison, taking a check here. What we would do is we would spread the pile out after mixing, and we had pre-calculated the density of the sand, the ZBI, and we knew the appropriate density of the proper ZBI sand ratios, and we would check it based on a known volume, which was this bucket. This was really critical because we wanted to ensure that we weren't using ZBI too quickly or that we would have ZBI left at the end of the project. Now talk a little bit about the excavation and PRB installation. You can see here the PRB being excavated. We used a trench box in the upper portion to hold back the alluvium. That trench box is 20 feet long, 10 feet tall, and four feet wide on the inside, five feet wide at the outside. And we had two of these and they kind of leapfrogged each other throughout the excavation. So the total trench was 195 feet long and it was 25 feet deep. The ZVI PRB extended from total depth to five feet below grade. Um, the trench box was basically just used at the top of the trench. We had fairly confident bedrock below and were able to dig down open hole below the trench box, starting between eight and 12 feet generally. Uh, the bedrock is fairly soft claystone, so the excavator was able to cut through it, but the trench would stay open. Um, the four foot per portion of the trench used that 25% ZBI mixture. However, we had to add extra sand to the top because it was five feet wide and we did not want to run out of ZBI. Uh, in excavations themselves, we didn't have a UST or a known source that we were targeting. We were targeting hot spots. But as you can see on this slide, there was a lens of material that was discovered within excavation area A. That's the largest excavation area and the one immediately adjacent to the warehouse. So you can see it in place on the left and two up close photos of it on the right. It does not look anything like the local geology and it appears to be within the alluvium and with fill on top. So we suspect this was some sort of sludge pit or unlined sludge cell that had been left in place. Uh, we continued to excavate until we reached our target depths and the impacted soil was taken to a landfill. In total, we removed about 6,700 tons of impacted material. Once we completed the export, we began filling in the excavation. And as I mentioned before, there was a 50% ZBI, 50% sand layer added to the bottom of each excavation. It was a one foot lift. And to protect that from mixing during backfill, we placed a permeable geotextile fabric over the top of that. Now, the purpose of putting the ZBI in the bottom of the excavations was twofold. It aligns with where we expect to see high groundwater. And so as groundwater comes up, if it's impacted with TCE that remains below the excavation, it will impact the ZBI and get treated. And additionally, we backfilled these excavations with clean fill, so it protects that clean fill from any back diffusion from remaining uh, vapor phase TCE below the excavation. Once the ZVI was in place, we filled it back up with local quarry material, and then we applied hydro seed at the surface. Hydro seeds a uh, spray on uh, substance that contains local seed and grass mixtures and it's got some fiber and some green dye in it, so you can see where it's been applied. It's very typically used in California after fires, but it works great for post excavation when you've disturbed a large area. You can see in the lower left, the cow pasture has been fenced off and there's still fencing remaining until we get enough vegetation to prevent runoff into the stream. We're currently in performance monitoring and we're going to be doing quarterly monitoring for one year. We've got 11 performance monitoring wells and the three surface water locations. And it's been a very dry year, so we don't actually have any results to share from performance monitoring yet, but we're entering the rainy season now and hope to see some soon. 
So to sum up the benefits of the methods of our work at this site, the passive soil gas sampling allowed us to quickly and cost effectively identify the areas and chemicals of concern. This saved years of sampling to try and determine appropriate areas for remedial action. The passive soil gas sampling allowed us to come up with a robust site conceptual model very quickly and to target well installations to define the areas of concern. Our corrective action planning, particularly the bench scale testing, allowed us to identify that ISCO was not appropriate for this site. Several other technologies were also determined to be infeasible due to site conditions. A risk assessment and remediation planning allowed us to address safety hazards, including remote work, a high number of rattlesnakes, and working out of town during the COVID surge last winter. The corrective action removed a significant portion of the contaminant mass and will provide protection for the down gradient stream. Long term monitoring will allow us to determine the path forward for the site. Thanks for your attention. Justin and I are happy to answer questions at this point. Thanks, Carrie. Thanks, Justin. Um, yeah, as Carrie said, if you have any questions, you can either enter them into the chat, um, we'll read them out, or you can raise your hand and uh, we call on you. Uh, Mahir Chokshi, I see you have your hand raised. You can unmute yourself. Hey, Gary and uh, Justin, thanks for presenting and uh, uh, excellent presentation. I have two questions. Uh, the first question I have is regarding the, the soil gas sampling with the beacon samplers you guys did. Uh, can you give us a flavor on the uh, two perspectives, the cost and schedule benefits of using uh, a pre-screening tool like the, the soil gas samplers that you have used. And two is, um, how does it compare against a MIP or HIPT uh, tool, which gives you a three-dimensional profile versus uh, the soil gas profile, which is mostly spatial, two-dimensional? Uh, I can handle the first one. Um, so we were able to install the 73 probes in about two days. So that was about two days of the work. We waited 21 days. Uh, Justin's got to come over to this mic. Hang on one sec. Sorry, we're having some technical difficulties. So basically, um, for the uh, passive soil gas survey, we were able to install the 73 probes for the first event in, in about two days wait a couple weeks and then um, retrieve them in another day and a half, two days. And so uh, the cost was a lot lower than actually doing um, a bunch of direct push work. Um, and uh, we were able to um, and, and do it rather quickly. The issue with doing MIP was, was the bedrock out there. And um, the bedrock varies. Uh, it can be from about four feet below ground surface to 10 to 15 feet below ground surface. So the MIP wasn't something that we were looking at just because of the shallowness of the uh, the bedrock out there. Excellent. So if I might say, we're looking at what, about 20% of the cost, if you had to do direct push versus the way you guys did, you ended up spending 20% compared to what you would have spent. Yeah, I'd say 20%. Uh, and then we were able to come back in and do some confirmation sampling, and we were able to target our monitoring wells. We did have a couple monitoring wells that were pre-existing from the oil field consultant. So we did know kind of a little bit about the um, the groundwater, uh, where the groundwater impacts were, but we just we really didn't know where where any source areas were because we didn't have any of that information about what was there and where it was stored. So the, 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 the best thing about the passive soil gas survey is it really helped us identify where those source areas may be uh, just because, you know, otherwise we were kind of flying blind, not knowing. Where to poke holes. Yep, uh, excellent. And I'm, I'm assuming the passive soil gases gave you specific concentration of contaminants or was it just total Vs, uh, CVOCs? No, it gave us specific. We were able to speciate between the chlorinated compounds, TCE. So we basically um, went with the, most of the chlorinated TCE, PC, vinyl chloride, cis. Uh, we also did TPH. Um, and VTEX just to see uh, if there were any oil field contaminants, which there are, there is some commingling there um, because the oil field um, impacts are, are in and around where we're at. 
Excellent. And I promise this is my last question. No problem. <laughs> Uh, in terms of your PRB design, uh, what kind of modeling or life cycle planning you did for the PRB? Because, uh, of course, you know, with California, the biggest trouble is, uh, I think Carrie uh, mentioned earlier, is you could get dry weather for months and then you get 30 inches or so, certain inches of rain out of nowhere. So how did you guys plan such that the PRB would, you know, be reactive when you have the worst case conditions or and or real droughts where it's not drawing out and creating piping effect. Well, luckily for for this site, the TCE is really only mobile when the water is there and moving with it. So it's only an issue when the water is moving. So we kind of looked at that, and uh, that that was really our strategy. Yeah, and, and you know that 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 trench is four feet wide, so and it's near that intermittent stream. We find there is more water and a little bit more movement near the intermittent stream uh, than in the, up on the graded pad where where the bedrock shallower. Um, so uh, you know we had the help of some of our technical experts in designing the the PRB and 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 the size and the length and the width, and then uh, just on base based on you know historical. PRBs, we know it's going to be in place for you know, 30 some odd years or, or longer. OK. Thank you. Thanks, guys. That was a great discussion. Uh, if there's any more questions, feel free to raise your hand or enter it into the chat and we can read it out. Uh, the attendance form for the CEU credits has been posted in the chat, um, so you should be able to download it. If you uh, have any issues downloading it and you wanted to get CEU credit, you can email me uh, at jessica.bennett.parsons.com and I can get the form to you. Uh, and if you go to the next slide. Uh, so we do have one more question um, from uh, Brian. I'm going to butcher your last name, so I'm going to say Brian J. Um, how deep have you completed the PRB? The PRB went to 25 below, feet below ground surface, which is into the bedrock. Um, and we, we we know based on our groundwater monitoring that there is some some contamination within the bedrock. So it's it's screened across that bedrock, but it's 25 feet is the uh, the depth. So it's basically uh, the ZVI is from five feet to 25 feet. Uh, water near the PRB is historically between seven and six feet below ground surface. So we're we're just a, you know about a foot or two above the, where the, the high water is uh, with the uh, ZVI. Uh, and Brian, I see you asked um, about depth of PRBs we completed at other sites. Um, we'll definitely follow up with you on that and get you a response about um, kind of a, the how deep we've installed PRBs elsewhere. Um, if there's no more questions, uh, thank you for everybody for joining today uh, for our webinar. Uh, this was the last webinar of 2021. Um, so please stay tuned for our list of uh, webinars for 2022. We have an exciting lineup that we're just about to finalize, so that will be published soon. Um, thank you, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you.